Mexi. Happy PLN Day, everyone. This month has felt incredibly charged. There's a ton of crucially important activism going on right now. And with it, there's a lot of hope, some heartwarming shows of solidarity, and yes, some very noteworthy leftist wins. Although the colonial violence that has been inflicted on Palestinians since the Nakba is unspeakable and in no way positive, we are witnessing a global shift in the narrative around the Israeli occupation, and the level of support that we're seeing for Palestinian liberation around the world is unprecedented. This month, we saw millions of activists around the globe stand up for a free Palestine, and even mainstream organizations like Human Rights Watch have had to admit that this is an apartheid regime. In Toronto, over 5,000 people came out for Palestine on the 15th as part of a global day of solidarity. The energy was electric. Leaving the rally felt like the Raptors had just won the playoffs. People were honking, leaning out of their cars with Palestinian flags, banging drums, and chanting for liberation. Significantly, we've seen an unprecedented level of resistance and solidarity within Israel as well. Thousands of Palestinian and Jewish Israeli citizens have been demonstrating against Israeli colonialism, with the biggest anti-occupation rally in years happening in Tel Aviv. This is outstanding. A major shift in polling concerning young Americans shows far more support for the Palestinian cause than previous generations. The Democratic Party base seems to have shifted in favor of Palestinian human rights. But most importantly, we're seeing workers worldwide step up to stop Israeli war crimes. In Italy, unionized port workers at the port of Livorno refused to load a ship which was supplying weapons to Israel in solidarity with the Palestinian liberation struggle. The workers received news that the arms containing ship would be arriving in Livorno from the Autonomous Port Workers Collective of Genoa and Weapon Watch. Upon receiving the news, they called a strike for Saturday the 15th and demanded not only that the government clarify publicly whether authorization for the ship's cargo had been granted, but that all such shipments to Israel be halted. The ship, called Asiatic Island, left the port of Livorno that same day without having loaded the containers of weapons it was meant to pick up, and the same scene repeated itself at the next destination as dock workers in Naples also refused to load weapons onto the ship. And in South Africa, where international solidarity helped to bring down their apartheid regime, unionized workers also refused to offload an Israeli ship docked at Durban Harbor. The ship, the Zim Shanghai, is owned by Israeli state-owned company Zim Lines, which also owns the Asiatic island. The South African Transport and Allied Workers Union said that the move is part of a set of global actions in support of Palestine. International working class decolonial solidarity honestly brings a tear to my eye. This is how apartheid regimes fall. In yet another brilliant showing of working class solidarity, protesters in Glasgow, Scotland successfully forced immigration enforcement officers to release two Indian asylum seekers that they had abducted from their homes. Shouting, let our neighbors go, hundreds of people flooded Kenmore Street and surrounded the home office van, with one man crawling under the van to prevent it from moving. Scotland's first minister said this action was unacceptable. To act in this way in the heart of a Muslim community as they celebrated Eid and in an area experiencing a COVID outbreak was a health and safety risk. Citing risk assessment and public safety, Scotland police forced Home Office to back down on national TV and release the men. The people united will never be defeated. Hundreds of thousands of Colombians have been protesting for weeks on end amid deadly repression. They've joined mass marches, roadblocks, and other protests across the country, with the largest crowds coming out on May Day. The recent protests began with a national strike on April 28th, called by the National Strike Committee, a coalition of trade union confederations, farmers associations, and student groups formed in 2019 to channel growing unrest in the working class towards fighting the far-right government of President Ivan Duque. The strike was triggered by Duque's announcement of Latin America's first COVID-19 tax overhaul, which sought to place the burden of the pandemic crisis on the shoulders of the working class. Having lost the support of the Liberal Party and other right-wing forces for his tax bill, happily Duque announced that he would ask Congress to drop, at least temporarily, its most hated provisions. 
The next story was sent in by a viewer in Puerto Rico, where there have been massive demonstrations by workers of the UTR union and their supporters against the privatization of the electrical grid scheduled for June. You'll remember that the disaster capitalists had their sights set on the public electrical service since it was devastated by Hurricanes Maria and Irma. The company is called Luma, and activists have made sure that everywhere you go you see UTR logos and Fuera Luma. The fight continues, so major solidarity with UTR and their supporters. In Los Angeles, Judge David O. Carter ordered the city and county to provide shelter or housing to the entire unhoused population of Skid Row by October. He granted a preliminary injunction sought by the plaintiffs and now is telling the city and county that they must offer single women and unaccompanied children on Skid Row a place to stay within 90 days, must help families within 120 days, and finally, by October 18th, offer every unhoused person on Skid Row housing or shelter. He also ordered the county to offer support services to all homeless residents who accept the offer of housing, including placements in appropriate emergency, interim, or permanent housing and treatment services. The cost would be split by the city and the county. It is not clear if the city will appeal the ruling, however, this does set a powerful legal precedent in the U.S. In an exemplary display of community solidarity, unhoused Oaklanders and activists have built their own unsanctioned community center from the ground up. They have equipped their shared space with a kitchen, shower, toilet, health clinic, free store, and other much needed resources. Each cabin provides a free service for the dozens of unhoused residents who live in the massive camp off Wood Street. There are amenities to meet people's basic needs, including the hot shower and a kitchen equipped with a stock refrigerator, but there are also things built just for fun, such as a pizza oven, a communal fire pit, and a stage for open mic nights. While the very fact that people need to build such communities when there are more unoccupied occupied homes than unhoused people speaks to the cruel horror of capitalism and the failure of the state. However, it is still beautiful to see community solidarity and even fun and joy in otherwise quite dire circumstances. After a 22-month battle with their employers, including eight months of strike action, more than 20 members of the cleaning staff at an Ibis hotel in Paris have won better pay and working conditions. After a series of tough negotiations, the women successfully obtained a salary increase of between 250 and 500 euros per month, a 20% reduction in the rate of their work, a break during the day, a guarantee to work at least five hours a day rather than the previous four, and a time clock to ensure that those working hours are respected. Rachel Keke, one of the leaders, said, We're proud of what we've achieved because we fought through to the end. We never gave up. I kept saying to my colleagues, We have to hang on. We'll win in the end. And now we have this wonderful victory. More than 1,000 coal miners at Warrior Met Coal in Brookwood, Alabama, have been on strike since April 1st. Since their venture capital-backed employers hadn't budged, local supporters organized the Alabama Strike Fest, a benefit concert and comedy show to raise money for the Miners' Strike Fund and support their ongoing fight with management. One of the performers, Lee Baines III, said union miners helped to build our hometowns of Birmingham, Bessemer, and the surrounding areas, and were on the front lines of struggles for workers' rights, integration, children's rights, and incarcerated people's rights. There is a deep, rich history of Alabamians fighting against power structures for themselves and each other, and it's so inspiring and galvanizing to see Alabamians reclaiming that heritage. Artifacts known as the Benin Bronzes, which were looted by British forces during a military expedition to the Kingdom of Benin in what is now Nigeria in 1897, will be returned, finally, by Germany. May all artifacts taken in colonial plunder be returned, plus reparations. The movement of landless rural workers gave up more than 100 tons of food throughout Brazil this month. The action was part of the so-called Jornada de Lutas, an event held annually in memory of the victims of El Dorado dos Carajas. In 11 days, they also distributed more than 50,000 liters of water to people living on the streets and in drought regions. In addition, according to the MST, donations in peripheral communities totaled 3,000 liters of milk, 1,500 protective masks, 700 basic food baskets, and more than 16,000 lunch boxes. On the 17th of April, which was the National Day of Struggle for Agrarian Reform and International Day of Peasant Struggle, there were more than 100 symbolic acts carried out in 24 states. 
and maybe one of the coolest things I've ever heard of. Activists are grafting fruit producing limbs onto sterile urban trees in order to fight urban food insecurity. Apparently, urban designers choose sterile versions of fruit bearing trees, which are intentionally bred not to bear fruit to decorate city streets. They claim the sterility is because they don't want to be held liable for any potential mess created by fallen fruit or any animals it could attract. But just imagine the kind of food secure, multi species urban commons we could create if we had free food growing everywhere throughout cities. The movement to Gorilla Graph started in 2012 in San Francisco, home to 10,000 fruitless fruit trees. The group's founder, Tara Hui, tried pursuing legal avenues to get the city to legalize fruit trees, but went rogue when she realized that that was getting her nowhere. She has since formed a group of dozens of stealth grafters in the San Francisco Bay Area, with thousands of followers on Facebook, many of whom have formed grafting groups in their own cities. The spliced branches are taped up in color-coded electrical tape, so volunteers can monitor the trees and make sure the fruit is harvested and not wasted. Once it heals, it connects, Hui said. Basically, the branch becomes part of the tree, and by that time, it's too late for the city to do anything about it. It's like the gardener's version of graffiti, said UC Davis landscape architecture professor Claire Napawan. Even if there's some question about its ability to produce enough food to make a difference, as an awareness piece, it's a good idea. The Bay Mills Indian Community Tribal Council voted to banish Enbridge's Line 5 pipelines from their reservation as well as lands and waters of their ceded territory as efforts grow to fight the controversial Michigan project. According to a statement issued by the tribe, the Treaty of 1836 has reserved the right for tribal citizens to hunt, fish, and gather in their ceded territory for all time. This includes the waters of Lake Superior, Huron, and Michigan which comprise the Straits of Mackinac. Enbridge's continued harm to our treaty rights, our environment, our history, our citizens, and our culture is a prime example of how banishment should be used," said President Whitney Gravel of the Bay Mills Executive Council. Banishment is a permanent and final action that is used to protect all that we hold dear, Gravel said. And this isn't so much a win, but an interesting symbolic statement. 500 years after Hernan Cortez and his men colonized Mexico, a small contingent of Zapatistas are sailing across the Atlantic to symbolically invade Spain. We're following the route that they came from 500 years ago, said Subcomandante Moises. In this case, we're following the route to sow life, not like 500 years ago. It's completely the opposite. If they are unable to enter the country, they plan to unfurl a banner reading WAKE UP, but they said if we are able to disembark and embrace with words those who fight, resist, and rebel there, then there will be parties, dancing, songs, and cumbias, shaking the floors and distant skies. Their plan is to meet with activist groups and organizations to share their thoughts on how to best tackle the inequality that comes from the capitalist socioeconomic system. Ecuador's constitutional court has ruled in favor of decriminalizing abortion in cases of rape, a decision that paves the way for laws imposing prison sentences in such cases to be changed. The court's judges voted 7-2 to two in favor of declaring two articles of the country's penal code unconstitutional. The decision came in response to a petition from seven women's, feminists, and human rights groups. The Left Democratic Front won in the communist province of Kerala, India, with an increased majority in this month's Legislative Assembly elections. The LDF, a coalition of left-wing parties, sailed to victory, gaining seven seats, bringing them to 98 seats in the 140-seat Assembly. Prakash Karat said the victory demonstrated that the people of Kerala have appreciated the performance of the government and the way it tackled floods in the state, the COVID-19 pandemic, and remained committed to working for the people. Communist Party of India General Secretary Sitaram Yachuri paid tribute to those who have lost their lives in the preventable scourge of the coronavirus pandemic, saying that the Kerala model has been an example to the world on how to handle the crisis. The province's success has been attributed to investment in public services and the distribution of power right down to the village and neighborhood councils. Show us how it's done, Kerala. In a huge victory for leftist forces in Chile and a crushing blow for its neoliberal government and ruling right-wing coalition, Chileans voted overwhelmingly for independents and leftists to draft the country's new constitution. The vote to pick 155 citizens to rewrite the constitution was born from powerful uprisings that erupted in October 2019 over rampant inequality and corruption. The current constitution, drafted during the 1973 to 1990 dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet, is unsurprisingly believed to favor corporate interests over the rights of ordinary citizens. Some of the more radical ideas being proposed for the new constitution include changes to private land and water rights, as well as to labor rights that directly threaten Chile's oligarchy. Gabriel Boric, a leading member of Chile's far-left 
Broad Front Coalition, said of the electoral win, we are looking for a new treaty for our indigenous populations to recover our natural resources and build a state that guarantees universal social rights. We're going to start from scratch and build a new Chile. Allende would be proud. In local elections in Zagreb, Croatia this month, the eco-socialist Mozemo, or We Can Party, won by a landslide. The mayoral candidate Tomislav Tomasevic won 45% of the vote and is sure to confirm his victory in the second round against far-right populist runner-up Miroslav Škoro that won only 12%. There were 10 candidates, so having such a lead in the first round is unprecedented. The coalition won 41% for the city assembly, resulting in 23 of 51 seats, which should enable them to carry out all the changes that the city drastically needs. This is a welcome change from the previous mayor, the now deceased Milan Bandic, who rose to the seat through a center-left Social Democratic Party, but later aligned himself more strongly with the major conservative party, and who had a habit of stealing and laundering money through public construction projects. Former left-wing president of Brazil, Lula da Silva, stopped just short in an interview from explicitly stating that he will run against right-wing president Bolsonaro. Lula's political rights were restored after he was freed from jail and his corruption charge dismissed by the Supreme Court. Later, the same court ruled that Sergio Moro, the Bolsonaro-aligned judge who jailed Lula before joining Bolsonaro's cabinet, had not been impartial in court proceedings. Turns out that conspiring with the prosecution isn't a good look. Bolsonaro, who has completely bungled Brazil's COVID response, is now responsible for the preventable deaths of 450,000 Brazilians, a number second only to America. When asked if he was planning to run against Bolsonaro, Lula said, I'll be 77 by next year's election. I thought that was old, but but then I saw Biden win the elections at 78 and said, well, I'm a boy compared to Biden, so perhaps I'll be all right. As Bolsonaro's approval ratings have plummeted to record lows as a congressional inquiry investigates his utterly failed COVID response, all signs are pointing to a Workers' Party victory in 2022, Lula Libre. Non-human animals are to be formally recognized as sentient beings in UK law. While it is unbelievable that they were not recognized as such before, this precedent will offer a range of protections including halting most live animal exports and banning the import of hunting trophies. The reforms will be introduced through a series of bills, including an animal sentience bill, and will cover farm animals and pets in the UK, and will include protections for animals abroad through bans on ivory and shark fin sales, and a potential ban on foie gras. However, the use of cages for poultry and farrowing crates for pigs will not be subject to an outright ban, as campaigners had called for. Frankly, laws that recognize the sentience of animals and protect the lives of pets and other animals, while leaving food animals caged, manipulated, and slaughtered in the most brutal ways, are fairly contradictory. So solidarity with campaigners, but the fight continues until every cage is empty. Germany's Supreme Constitutional Court has ruled that the government's climate protection measures are insufficient to protect future generations after a complaint brought by environmentalist groups that the government's goals were focused on dates too far in the future. The judges of Germany's highest court said the government now had until the end of next year to strengthen its Climate Protection Act, which was passed in 2019, by laying out in more detail how Germany will reach its greenhouse gas reduction goals by 2030. It should be absolutely criminal that our politicians and a handful of major corporations corporations are condemning us, other species, and future generations. Which is why this next story is so wonderful. We previously reported that Friends of the Earth Netherlands, along with six other organizations and 17,000 Dutch citizens, took Shell Oil to court, arguing that Shell was causing dangerous climate change and that they needed to reduce emissions by 45% to be in line with the Paris Agreement. The Hague Court ruled this month against Shell and has indeed ordered them to at once reduce their CO2 emissions by 45% with a reference year of 2019. The court order remains in power even if RDS takes up an appeal. The 45% refers to a net reduction of emissions instead of the absolute reduction that activists wanted, leaving the door open for carbon capture and storage or planting trees, etc. But Shell is responsible for all of the fossil fuels it sells, including branches operating outside of the Netherlands. Judge Larissa Alwyn said that the ruling would have far-reaching consequences for the company and may curb the potential growth of the Shell Group. Roger Cox, lawyer for Friends of the Earth Netherlands, called on organizations across the world to pick up the gauntlet 
and take legal action to force multinationals to play their full part in tackling the climate emergency. He said this case is unique because it is the first time a judge has ordered a large polluting corporation to comply with the Paris Climate Agreement. This ruling may also have major consequences for other big polluters. Congratulations to all of the activists involved. And lastly, some adorable animal comrades have helped activists to forestall construction of the Trans Mountain Pipeline in Canada, a pipeline that has been fiercely resisted by several Indigenous nations and their allies. Environment and Climate Change Canada ordered work on the pipeline to stop until the 21st of August after the discovery of an Anna's hummingbird nest in a tree fell during construction of the pipeline. Anna's hummingbirds are not endangered but are protected under federal law, and community groups in southern British Columbia had raised the alarm that Trans Mountain was chopping down trees in vulnerable nesting areas. While the hummingbird has only stopped construction for a few months, it buys activists more time to keep resisting its construction. Solidarity, you beautiful little comrades. Comrades, if you have good news from the current month, please send your stories to veganvanguardpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you to Javi for the positive news jams. Thank you to Halcyon for the positive news background. And thank you to Tristan for editing this video. Thank you also to our wonderful patrons who make the show possible. To become a sustaining member, please go to patreon.com slash positive leftist news. Sometimes.